Okay, first one, Brian. Hey, Coach. Uh, yes, sir. It wasn't just tonight. Oh, the offensive line has had kind of up and down here. You have some new guys in there tonight. What's going on that you guys just haven't been able to figure that side, or that area of the ball on? Uh, depth. Not only depth. Uh, killer instinct, want, desire, will, athleticism. Um, the hardest thing to acquire is linemen. So when people have a good one, you rarely see linemen jump. <laughs> And, and go to different schools. I think we have some some guys that uh, it's going to be good with a little seasoning. But overall, uh, we just don't have the the fight or the passion to to do what we want to do. Right? I'm a little biased because I'm his father, but I think we have the best quarterback in the country. Um, I don't think any other quarterback could put up with or stand and deliver like I always do week in and week out and, and, and taking the beating that he's taking. And uh, we got to address that. We got to address that um, scheme wise. We got to address that uh, functionally with what we have um, on the line. And we, we just got to do a better job. And I really do. Is that whistling? Do you hear that? I don't know. It's like a, it's a, Notification of other of team messages coming. You didn't hear that right there? No. That's weird. Huh. All right. All right. <laughs> do, you, do you like to whistle while you work? I don't know. It's just the sound it makes when, it, when I got a message coming in. I get to work. <laughs> I only, it only does it on this device. Okay. No, we're good. All right. Welcome into a. Oh, sorry, you got to stretch out at first. All right. Do we okay. need to do some calisthenics? All right. All right. Welcome in. Welcome into a new Buff Stampede Radio. Adam Mustard Tiger, the publisher of BuffStampede.com, joined by football analyst William Gardner to recap Colorado's trip out to the Rose Bowl. It is the last trip out to California for the foreseeable future for the Buffs. Maybe they'll play in a bowl game out there. Maybe they'll schedule some non-conference games out in that state. Uh, I was telling you, William, before we started here, that's not my favorite trip from a working standpoint because LA is tough to get around, but uh, felt a little bit more nostalgic this trip because knowing it's the last one and uh, stared at those palm trees a little bit longer than, than I had in the past because it it does have a lot to offer uh, if you have some free time uh, to, to go hang out on the beach. Well, you got some exciting destinations ahead of you next year, my friend. <laughs> some places where you, you won't even want to stay in the hotel. You'll just want to be out and about seeing town. <laughs> yeah. Manhattan, Kansas, you know, we're going to see, yeah. see how we're going to hit up the Applebee's for some reverse happy hour uh, wings. It, it'll be a good time. A but I actually, Apple. well, I love Lawrence. I like some of the small college towns in the big 12. It's just, it's harder to get to them. It really is. And, yeah. and so that's the part of it that, that's tough. Today's episode is brought to us by Macaulay Capital Fractional CFO Services. Is your business looking for financial guidance and support, but not yet big enough to hire a full-time CFO? Well, we have a solution for you. Hiring a fractional CFO who can work with your business on a part-time basis. You get the benefit of having a seasoned financial expert on your team without the commitment or expense of a full-time hire. And here's the best part. It's likely that a partnership with Macaulay Capital will be a win-win situation, meaning that your business will make more money from the guidance of a fractional CFO than the total cost of partnering with us. For more information or to set up a meeting, please visit MacaulayCapital.com. That's M-C-C-A-U-L-E-Y Capital.com. Let's get to the UCLA game. Before the game, Coach Prime told Holly Rowe, as long as Shadur Sanders stays upright, this one's going to be interesting. Uh, and, and we know that uh, Shadur Sanders did not stay upright throughout that football game. I think the final tally was something like 24 pressures, 18 hits, uh, 13 knockdowns, seven sacks. Uh, I mean, you, you're you not going to win a football game, even if you win the turnover margin for nothing when that's the case to your quarterback. Well, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I guess I would say it stayed somewhat interesting until the end. It wasn't a blowout by any means. That's, we'll talk about that. I mean, that's 
credit to the defense coming along. I think we need to do some compare and contrast things there. But, um, yeah, you know, when your quarterback's getting hit that often, but then how how damn stupid do you have to be? How damn stupid do you have to be to keep calling the same damn plays? I mean, run the ball. What did we run the ball, nine times, eight, something like that? Uh, there were 11 design runs. Now, a, a few of those were late when, when the game was basically out of reach when they brought in right. Alton McCaskill right. late. So, uh, right. yeah, I mean, they they pretty much weren't running the football. Yeah. Yeah. And, and let's just that, let's just put it out there and talk about this because, you know, Coach Prime says at halftime, I want to run the ball more. And then they don't run the ball more. Now, is he the head damn coach or is he not? I mean, I, I don't know the answer to the question. You know, everybody, everybody with half a brain about football realize we need to run the ball, but they don't do it week after week. And it's it's incredibly frustrating. And it really makes you wonder what the hell's going on in the coaching staff and in those offices. You know, talk, 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 but show me something, you know, and you know, we'll 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 get to the offensive line and that coaching situation, and I'm sure. <laughs> But yeah. uh, I just want to vent that particular, you know, it's like, you know, when they do run the ball, it works and then they don't do it. And people say, well, they rush four guys and still get to us. Well, you know, when you know you don't have, as let, let's take defensive ends and, and outside linebackers only, when you know you don't have to ac- account for the run game, you've got that one split second that you get to use in the pass rush instead of reading the offense. And, and that gives you a huge jump uh, on, on a on pass rush against you know, tackles or what have you. So don't tell me that it doesn't matter whether they rush four or not, because it makes a huge difference if there's no run game. Yeah. There's that saying, the defenders pin their ears back. And that's what UCLA looked like. I mean, they, as it was said on the broadcast, I was rewatching the game this morning that, that they smelled blood. And it's, this O-line could be better if they run the football and if they could regain some confidence the way that they're calling plays right now. I agree with you they're not going to gain that confidence as a group. And it doesn't matter who you put in there. Now, Jack Wilty showed us why he wasn't on the field in previous weeks. That, that was, that was hard to watch. Well, but you have to wonder what the hell happened there too, because the guy was perfectly serviceable against T- Texas Christian in the game one. And he wasn't all American by any means, but he's certainly gotten worse, significantly worse since then. And you have to wonder what's going on. Yeah. Yeah, they they moved around some bodies. It sounds like there were some injuries up front. Uh, Tank didn't get the start, but he came in later, and he was their highest graded offensive lineman. But I mean, just in general, that's as about a, a, about as rough an effort as you can get from your offensive line when your quarterback can't get to his first option. It's on the protection. There were times earlier this season where Shador was holding on to the ball too long, and some of those sacks were yeah. a result of that. But that wasn't the case out at the Rose Bowl. That was that was on the protection. Well, it, it, and frankly, it, it, it was a, a you know it was a total breakdown, like nothing I've ever really seen. Quite frankly, and I've been kind of racking my brain trying to think of of, of any kind of comparable situation of an offensive line. You know, even in some of our worst years. I don't remember seeing that. And I swear to God, watching it sometimes, I thought they'd given up or do they even care or, you know, but, you know, it, it, what's what's maddening to me is it's not, okay, I'm going to say it, go ahead and laugh if you want. It ain't about talent because, you know, when you got one guard going this way, one guard going that way, that's just that they don't know what the hell they're doing. You know, when you got a guy that's supposed to be pass protecting, he tries to reach block like it's a run play. That's just that's just not knowing what the hell you're doing or, or not using the right technique or something. I, I don't I don't understand it. Um, you know, and and they don't even have they're so I I, I pardon me thinks that they're so rattled now that they just they just can't even think out there or or, or play the dang game. But uh, I don't know. You know, I mean, I know what the answer would be if I was coaching that offensive line, but. They, if, if I was coaching that offensive line, we wouldn't have this situation. One of the great things about this podcast, William, is that we we talk for like an hour, over an hour a lot of the time. So we can go a little bit more in depth on it than I do with my videos with Brian. And, and you talked about the, the talent issue there. We, with the old line and their issues right now, there's kind of a blame pie, right? And, and you allocate, allocate it in certain areas. Uh and certainly Bill O'Boyle has got a big slice of that just because we are not seeing this group get better. But um, I would push back a little bit in terms of the guard play. 
it has been an issue talent wise to me. Um, I, I think that Tank, Savion Washington, and Van Wells are guys that could start for most teams in the country. So that part of it with those three guys, I agree. But, you know, we talk about you're only as good as your weakest link, uh, especially on defense in the offensive line. And when I see their guards just manhandled, it, it's like, uh, you know, varsity versus JV situation with sometimes with those guys. And th- that's where the talent to me comes into the blame pie in terms of, you know, they don't have the guards that they need. And maybe Tyler Brown would have been one of those pieces this year if he was eligible, but um, there, uh, and, and then there's also the depth. There's not talent in the depth either. So they need yeah. to upgrade that. Well, that, you know, that's going to bring us to another topic, which I think we need to discuss today, which is the, the, the you know, First of all, the transfer portal is not how you're going to build a line over overnight because they're 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 just not available there. And secondly, the whole inside out, outside in type of philosophy, we're going to have to talk about that too because that ain't working. But I I don't agree. And to frankly, when you talk about seeing um, uh, uh, who who are guys, BB Wilty and um, um, Jack uh, Bailey Bailey. You know, I've only seen them get thrown around and manhandled a handful of times. You know, people see that once or twice, and then it gets repeated on on replays a lot of times, and then that's the narrative. They're getting manhandled, pushed around. Well, that's not really the case. And I'll sit down and watch the damn videos with anybody that wants to watch them, and we'll count, okay? They have enough talent to be a successful offensive line. They really do, you know, but you have to put them in positions – uh, or they can have some success. You also have to teach them how to play the damn thing. You know, Oregon State's made themselves a top 20 team by bringing in a succession of linemen, no more talented than these guys, and the, but they develop them, or at least in terms of at least in terms of how they're rated coming out of high school or, you know, transfer or whatever. You know, they're, they're low 80s guys, maybe mid 80s guys for the highest level ones that they bring in, and they develop them and turn them into good linemen. So, I don't know, man. You know, I, 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 I just disagree. I think that uh, I'm not I'm not saying that any of those guards could be all Americans, but they could certainly be serviceable at this level. And they were at, at various different times because I see plays where they do just fine. So I don't know, you know, like McChesney put up that video where he, he broke down one play and he, and he showed both of the guards were doing the wrong thing. And that's here's the problem. People say, well, let's just bring in better talent. We'll be better. No, we won't. No, he won't. You bring in a five-star All-American future NFL All-Pro, and he steps the wrong damn direction, he's going to look just as bad as Jack Bailey. So if they're not doing the right thing, if they don't understand the scheme, if they don't understand the blocking assignments, if they don't understand technique, they're still going to get beat no matter how good they are. So there's four games left in the schedule. Is there any hope for that group in terms of uh, finishing out the season uh, on a better note? Uh, does it come down to play calling? What what can get that group to a, a point of, uh, you know, just being competent out there? I honestly, God, believe after thinking about it since Saturday night that they got to fire old Boyle and put Shermer in there to finish out the season. I mean, I don't know who else they, you know, if there's no other possibility, but he was a, a, a you know, 10 to 12 year uh, offensive line coach at the power five and NFL level. But I, I don't think they can do it with O'Boyle. I just don't. I mean, it, at this point, he's lost that room. The whole room has been told they're going to get replaced by the head coach. Uh, it, it's a disaster, man. I, you know, I, it, it, it's, it's like the old, uh, you know, saying attributed to Albert Einstein, keep doing the same thing, expect different results is insanity, right? Well, you know, we've had the same guy there since the, since January, and this is where we are. What, what would possibly make anyone think it's going to change under that guy? Yeah, eight games is a pretty, pretty sizable sample size at this point. Um, yeah, and they're getting uh, worse, Adam. I mean, they're getting – week to week, they're getting worse, man. I don't know what the hell they're doing in practice. I really don't. I don't have access to that. I don't get to watch it. They don't get to post that. But they're getting worse. I mean, this was the worst yet. You know, now, now again – Now, UCLA has some talent on their front, too, as well. well that, that certainly yeah. played into it. Yeah, but 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 it, it, it was a total – yeah, that, 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 that doesn't help, but – it was a total breakdown on all levels. And again, I don't know what the hell's going on with the play calling. And, you know, I, somebody got photographs of somebody, man, because uh, 
uh, this refusal to run the ball, um, and with the with the backs that are effective doing it, they, they you know, I guarantee you, you 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 start running the ball from the start of the game, and and you start getting three and four yards of carry and all that sort of stuff, and maybe not be as fun as exciting, but your offense is going to get significantly more effective immediately. And I don't care. Quite frankly, you don't even have to be successful at it. You just have to do it so that they have to respect it and 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 watch for it. You know that that's one of the fallacies people have. You got to if you don't run for two hundred yards, you're not being effective with the run game. That's not true. Part of it is you you have to be effective enough, but you also have to keep a defense honest. And there's nothing honest about a defense now. I I'd, I'd walk over to Lewis and laugh in his face and say, I know you're not gonna run the ball, so you know I'm not even putting the backers out there, Chief. I'm gonna just go with a bunch of defensive backs there, big man, because. I I got I got to figure that you know other teams when they're doing scouting for us, you know before our games have, have got to sit there and watch our offensive video. And go, what the hell? What what are these these guys are getting paid for this? What the hell are they? What's the, even the philosophy of this? And I got to add, you know, I'm almost a speechless man. It's like you know what the hell's Coach Prime doing, man? You're the boss. I mean, this is on you. And I, I don't know, man. I, I guess we better. I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna vapor lock up here if we keep talking about that. You're fired up. You're fired up. You know, that, that was that was a tough loss to stomach. There's no doubt about it. And, um, yeah. The, well, the made, one thing, the one thing that I've really disagreed with Coach Prime about is is the running game, and um, he he brings up the fact that it's not effective. If you do the adjusted rushing stats, you know, when you take out the lost yeah. sack yardage. It's it's not a great rushing offense, but it's serviceable. You know, you've got yeah. Anthony Hankerson, you got a back that can get some tough yards. So they've well, certainly got the ability to be better at that if they decide they want to uh, implement that as part of their game plan going forward. Well, when has it not worked in eight games? When has it not worked? And when they've when they've actually called those plays. Now, you know, again, you don't have to be a three hundred yards rushing. You don't have to be. See you wishbone in 1993, you know, to be effective in the run game. But, you know, when you're getting three and four yards a carry and, and you're moving the ball and you're eating up the clock, that is, and, it, and we don't, I don't, I don't give a damn about the stats. We all see it with our own lying eyes, man. You know, mm. when they run the ball, it works and they don't do it. The coach even said, I'm walking in at halftime, we need to run the ball more. Well, you're, you know, you're not running the ball if you don't call the play. So I, I don't know what's going on, and I don't know where the disconnect is, but it feels, and, and I don't have any inside information, but it feels like there's something really wrong in there somewhere, and I don't really know how to put my finger on it. And I don't like, quite, quite frankly, I don't like having both coordinators on the sidelines. I don't know how the hell they know what's going on because you can't see what's happening from down there, but I don't know if that has anything to do with it or not. Yeah. Good points, William. Uh, let's go kind of recap the game a little bit. Uh, let's start with Alejandro Mata's first field goal. How in the – I paused it when the UCLA defender was almost up on Mata. And at that point, you really couldn't envision a scenario in which that field goal doesn't get blocked. Yeah, I, yeah. We I watched, I was watching with the wife. I was like, did he just pause? Did he, did he let that guy run past? And we ran it back. It's like, I think he's paused and let the guy run. I mean, it's a hell of a thing. Yeah, it's a yeah. It's a hell of a thing. I've, I don't think I've ever seen that in 40 years in football, a kicker hesitating and then still having to wear with Because usually, you know, there's such head cases. Sorry, kickers. Love you. But, uh, <laughs> you know, if they don't get their steps absolutely right, and, you know, and everything's just perfect like a picnic on Saturday, you know, but the dude paused and he still made it. It was awesome. Yeah. I thought it was awesome. Yeah. I thought it was amazing. Yeah. So those early two takeaways uh, only result in six points. And yeah. uh, that that was, well, it was the opening drive. And then it was, uh, they actually only got three points off the takeaways. They they had to be at least up 10 and 0 out the shoot for well, you to feel better about things. To be up six, nothing. Uh, there was a sinking feeling of, oh, they just totally blew a huge opportunity early well, in this game. Yeah. At one point, at one point, they threw a graphic up on the screen and, and um, obviously I wasn't at the game. I was watching on TV, but um, the, the UCLA, we already had four turnovers 
and we were losing seven to six. And I looked at the wife. I was like, not sure we ought to watch the rest of this, to be perfectly honest with you. Four turnovers by, by us, and we're down seven to six. This is going to be a bad night. Yeah. And I thought it would be a lot worse than it did, but God bless the defense for stepping up. Yeah, even Chip Kelly said going in uh, that when usually when you're down – four nothing in the turnover margin you're down 40 nothing on the scoreboard and so yeah. they felt very fortunate going in at, at halftime and um it, it's kind of like that team that loses momentum late in a basketball game and you go into overtime and you go oh they don't have a chance right. that's kind of the the way it felt it was like there was too many opportunities for Colorado they didn't take advantage and Shador's uh, getting attacked back there. And and so that's about as pessimistic as I've been at a halftime covering a Colorado game where they're only down by one point. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was nuts. I was like, uh, you know, I, I, we got to halftime and I'm like, I felt like we already lost the damn game, you know? And I, and, and I didn't have any, you know, it's funny because earlier in the year I had confidence that we'd go in at halftime when we'd come out with the better adjustments. I don't have that anymore. We don't, we don't come out in the second half and play better. At least not these last two games. Um, you know, and, and again, I, you know, every, every team I've ever coached, you know, before we went in at half, we all met as coaches and we talked about what's going on and what we're going to talk about. I get the impression these coaches don't talk to each other. I, I, I really, and, and let's, you know, I think we'll get more into this, but let's contrast what's happening with the offense, with the defense, because that defense is well coached because they're getting better week by week. And let's contrast the offensive line versus the defensive line. With that defensive line, you know, on paper, it doesn't have a heck of a lot more talent, but it's getting better every week because uh, Sal Sanceri and, and Nick Williams are doing their job and getting those guys better up front, you know. And uh, Nick Kelly or K Kelly is finding ways to use his guys creatively and, you know, I'll grant you he's got a generational talent out there at one corner, but, uh, um, you know, we got one of the best quarterbacks in the nation on offense and they can't make that work. So you, you look at the defense and, and I don't know if it has to do with the fact that, that prime was a primarily a defensive guy himself, but the defense is getting better week to week and the offense is regressing and going the wrong way. So I don't know, man, you know, I, I can't see anything, but I don't, you know, um, uh, Brewster, I like him as a coach, but what the hell is his point purpose on the team? I mean, they don't even use his position hardly. Um, but then again, it's like you, you talk about we they had a, the, that play that uh, McChesney put up again. It was Max Protect. They had an H-back or tight end guy in there, and, and they just didn't block it right. You know, it's like you had Max Protect in there, and and two guys stepped the wrong damn direction, and one guy reached blocked instead of pass blocked, and 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 and. <laughs> It was a jailbreak. So even with mass, max protect, you know, get out there. I I would tell you this. Here, here's what I would do. I, I, I If I was offensive line coach, first of all, we wouldn't be in this situation. Guarantee it. But if we were, if you took me and brought me in today and said, you got to take over this, I, I'd say I'll do it under one condition. You start. We're going to go. So we're going to we're going to go foot to foot. We're not even going to have splits and we're going to freaking tee off and just block people in the run game you're gonna call the damn run and we're gonna get that established okay and then we're gonna do a whole different thing with our pass pass game it's gonna have to be play action and, and come off the ball and hit people in the mouth one of the things that's missing to me from this offensive line is there's no aggressiveness there's no there's no nasty there's no physicality you know and i don't know what's going on you know uh that to me has always been your offensive line all your your whole team plays like your coach, right? You know, my mentality, my offensive lineman was, we're not out there. We're not, you know, if, even if we're pass protecting, you know, like you're, you're backing up, right? Well, and I've always taught it. You're not backing up away from somebody. You're backing up to set up to punch somebody. You, you're, you're not, you're not backing away from them. You're Muhammad Ali waiting for him to come and you're going to knock him out. Right. And you have that physicality and you have that uh, desire to really punish somebody and all the good offensive linemen I've ever known have that kind of mentality. I want to bury somebody and put them in the dirt. And I have not seen that once this year from this from this offensive line, you know. And I think Coach Prime touched on it when he said nobody helped stir up after after a certain play. And there's part of that too is like you know if somebody cheap shots your quarterback, somebody got to get their, their block knocked off. And if I got to get thrown as as an offensive line coach, if we get a 15 yard penalty because somebody enforces the fact that we're not going to let our guy get touched, I'm okay with that. But 
you know, we get crap penalties from our offensive line from, you know, all the, all the false starts and offsides we get is a lack of discipline. And, and that's from coaching. You Can know, I add to your point? I, I want to just throw in there that the fact that some of your best blocks this season have come from defense alignment. Yeah. Uh, kind of adds to that. Right. I mean, that's, you're not seeing that on a consistent basis from the guys that are offensive linemen. Yeah. Right. You know, and, and so, you, you know, you bring in, you bring in Shane Cokes and, and Bishop Thomas on, on the offensive front and uh, they're very physical and very, you know, and now you, 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 and here's what I'm saying. It's like, you know, so you, you put them in a situation where you, they don't have to think about what they're doing. You line them up like I, they line them up in that unbalanced line, right. And they're on this side. And I think basically they tell them just block what's in front of you. Okay. And that's all you really got to do, man. It doesn't have to be any more complex than that. And that's what I'm saying about the, the run game, close down your splits and you just tell them nobody gets through gaps. And, you know, I don't know, you know, it's, I'm making it sound more simplistic than it is, but um, it's not, you know, it's, it's not saying, Hey, go cure cancer for the world. Okay. How are we going to land on Mars? Figure that out for me. Would you? No, it's blocking football. All right. It's not, it's not, I don't know. I'm very, I'm pretty, I'm pretty frustrated and I, and I'm. Yeah, we can hear it. Yeah. in your voice for sure. Another positive, you mentioned the defensive front in, in their improvement. Jordan Dominic had his best game as a buff and, uh, I love the the gold grill he got to show off there after his first sack in the game. Have you ever yeah, uh, have you I ever ro- that, have you have you ever robbed a jewelry store and told them make me a grill? No, <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I have got to mark that on my bucket list. I write that down. But uh, remember, I just remember last week I was saying he was my breakout for the second half of the season guy, and I think he must have heard that. He's like, make me look good. Yeah. He had some great moves out there throughout yeah. the game. He he was flashing pretty much from start to finish. He got banged up a little bit in the, late in the third quarter, but uh, that was one of the best pass rushing performances. Carson Wells had a few of them, Mustafa Johnson, but uh, you got to go back to probably Jimmy Gilbert the last time Colorado's had uh, a pass rusher quite as talented as Jordan Dominic. And even with Jimmy Gilbert, it was just one year like it's going right. to be with Jordan Dominic because this is it for him. But he's not going to get to that double digit sack total we thought he might have a chance to do. Um, but unless he goes on a tear here the last month of the season, well, but two sacks a game, he's got four yeah, games. Yeah, that's true. Up. You yeah. know, I mean, it's not outside the realm of possibility. It'd be a hell of a finish to a season. And I got to tell you, you know, it does wonders for a defense when you've got, you know, a lockdown corner and a, and a, kick-ass pass rusher all of a sudden you can do things on defense and look real smart as a coach you know yeah yeah the defensive line i think had five of the top 10 graded players from this game yeah. by fo- pro football focus and a lot of it was just handling the responsibility and being stout in, in the run game because ucla they had some chunk plays um but n- not as many as i expected ucla to have going into that game yeah, and I think, you know, people were talking on the board last week about if I was Chip Kelly, I'd just run at uh, Trevor Woods and, and I'd bully them. Well, you know what? This defensive line is better than all of you all think it is. And there's some guys on there who who got some size and everybody doesn't have to be 320 pounds. There, there's there's some guys that are that got good size and they're being well coached and they're getting better. You know, Am- Amari McNeil is becoming a, quite a load up there. Shane Coates has been a, a, an effective player all year long. But, you know. People think, well, if they don't have six sacks and 20 tackles behind the line, they're not doing their job. That's not the case on the defensive line. That's just not how it works. You know, your your job is to beat up, is to occupy um, offensive linemen and let the linebackers, frankly, do their job. And, and I think where we've been falling short on this defense this season is the linebackers have not been doing their job. And I think they got better at that um, against UCLA. And hopefully it carries on like that. Now, you know, that's a defensive that's a defensive outing that in 2023 power five football should get you a win yeah Period. and it was a really good bounce back effort from the cornerbacks that you know yeah. rightfully took a lot of flack right. following that stanford game because that was a rough go at it but you know travis hunter not only the two picks he only gives up 12 yards in coverage on the other side Omarion Cooper, who I was glad to see him play the whole game pretty much uh, because he's he's earned that. He's their second best corner, yeah. and he didn't give up any any yards in coverage. So that was a, a truly fa- fantastic effort by those two guys. 
And here's and here's another thing that, that you know that that makes me think of that that was apparent to me is that defense has pride, man. You know those cornerbacks, you know they got trashed out rightfully so all week, and and you know I'm sure that in their room, I don't know whether it's Travis leading leading the talking or whatever, but they said this ain't happening again, man, because we're better than this. And who on offense is doing it? Who on offense is going to stand up and say this is bullshit? And we're not doing. This is not going to be okay, and it's not happening. And so credit to the to the cornerbacks and to the defense for for stepping up, and to the defensive coaches for uh, getting those guys to understand how to play the game right, and and you know be in the right spot at the right time and play with good technique and intensity. You know, because I think there's intensity missing on on the offense that, that used to be there. I, I don't know. It's, it's very frustrating and confusing but I don't think that we have an offensive identity I'm beginning to think that Lewis you know ha- has a magic eight ball or something or he's he just some kind of random play generator uh let's call this and see if it works you know so I think he he maybe he's, he's thinking they they got such good receivers we'll just let them run downfield and we'll throw the ball down and somebody will catch it well you know ain't working pal what were your thoughts on the Shiloh Sanders ejection? That was the most talked about play. Um, and, and now he did make some contact with his head, uh, but certainly made every effort to get his shoulder in there first. I made the point after the game that I felt like it's okay if you want to penalize Shiloh Sanders there, but the intent is clear that he's trying to not have his head get in the way. And sometimes – the offensive player is the one that kind of creates that, you know, that hit between heads. Uh, I'm okay with the penalty because there was some contact up top, but I really hate the ejection in that situation. And uh, maybe that's a way they can tweak the rule is to, is to have some different tiers for these targeting calls. Yeah. And I think it was a, I think it was a improper, I don't know. And I hate to bang the same old drum, but you know, he gets thrown out of the game for that. And that, POS from Colorado State, POS from CSU, didn't get thrown out of that game for what he did to uh, to Travis Hunter. I, I don't get right. it, man. There, right. There's not, yeah. there's not, there doesn't seem to be uniformity in, in how they're enforcing these rules in, in any way, shape, and form. I mean, you know, technically it wasn't the targeting against tra- tra- uh, Travis Hunter by Blackburn with the helmet, but it's the defenseless player has always been the, the main factor. In, in my view of those kinds of calls and throwing people out is, you know, you, you, you take a shot at a defenseless player and you ought to get kicked out. Now, I don't think that's what happened there with Shiloh. Um, and, you know, I mean, I it's, it's as much on this quarterback as it is anybody for setting them up them for in. that. Yeah. 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 You know, and, and, you know, sometimes you just, it's a contact game and, and it, I don't know, man, I, I, I just think that's an improper, I think, yeah, I agree with you that, that, Penalty would be fine, but throwing a guy out of a game and and for the first half of the next game for that particular play seems ridiculous to me. There are some plays where the defensive player is going incredibly low and the offensive player will put their head down and they'll still call a targeting. I love to see them start call that on the offensive guy every once in a while. If he's the one that is putting his head down in harm's way, and uh, even if he is taking the brunt of it, he's the one that you know creates that created that situation. So I don't know. Right. Tar- targeting is never going to be. We're probably going to be arguing about this twenty years from now because um, it, it's so subjective. Some of these calls, but right. man, it, it just it's been around in the game for a number of years now, and yet it's more confusing than ever. Right. Right. And they haven't clarified it and they tweak it here and there. And and it still comes down to a judgment call on the field, you know, and, and, you know, I don't envy the at rest being in that position. You got a hundred thousand people or 70,000 people sitting around and they're all watching you. And you, you got to make your decision as fast as you can. So it's keep the TV moving and blah, blah, blah. But uh, uh, I don't know. I, I think it, it seems like there ought to be some way you can clarify that and, and, I don't know. May, 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 I don't know. Maybe uh, you know, ejection is some kind of a last resort or something that you that you have a presumption in favor of not ejecting. I don't know. Going back to Travis Hunter, he's got when he talks about his goal of being the Hall of Fame, and you look at his combination of athleticism, but then you throw on there 
his antis- anticipation skills, his eyes. Well, yeah. I mean, yeah. It, it is off the chart. It is just incredible what we're watching. And there have been times this year, and partly because, you know, he was coming back from that that big hit. But, you know, we yeah. we haven't seen the best of Travis Hunter week to week based on some of the stuff he does in practice every day. No, and, it, and, it, and that, that one interception, you know, where he's covering the outside guy and he goes and he intercepts in front of the inside guy. Watch it again, and his eyes, the whole – he's watching that quarterback. And he's and he's, he's and he's got this guy sort of in his peripheral vision, but he's looking at that guy, and he's breaking as soon as that guy's throwing the ball because he can tell where it's going. And, you know, <laughs> I bet there's not one, one out of 100 cornerbacks in the NFL could do that. In the NFL, yeah. you know. Um because it's just it's like you know he's just a generational talent and, and he's only still at the beginning of his game too you know that's the crazy thing you know you well he's got 10 years of experience he gets a little bigger and older and whatever yeah, it's going to be just ridiculous Jaden Milliner and Jones had a couple of nice plays on special teams the safeties generally didn't have a very good night uh, you know, Slusher got beat on, on a big play for UCLA. Chuck Wes Robinson came in and gave up a couple plays. So not the best effort. Uh, Roger Ward, though, you know, he's been a pretty steady <laughs> performer there at safety, and he forced a fumble in that football game. A- any other thoughts as we close out on, on just talking about Colorado's defensive effort from this game? They had one penalty where they – were too late in getting the rotation in and Charles Kelly went crazy on the sidelines again. But fortunately that, that was the end of it because, uh, you know, I was worried uh, about Charles Kelly's heart and his, uh, I mean, (laughs) he's pretty animated. Yeah. And I, I I, uh, I love his, I love his demeanor as as a defensive coordinator. I hope he has success. They continue to show improvement and he's in Boulder for a long time because I like a lot of what he does. Now his defense is very complex. And if you're going to keep rebuilding through the portal every year, that's going to be an issue. I think at some point you might have to dumb it down a little bit. If you're going to be relying on a lot of new players year after year in this defense. Right. Yeah. And I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the thing that's really truly amazing about it is, you know, they they had that defensive performance with no offense whatsoever. You know, you know they were out there on the field a lot because the UCLA kept getting the ball back. And we didn't score, so you wonder if we even had a serviceable offense. What you know, what what they could what they, what they could have done um, out there. So I, I, I'm a, I'm very encouraged by uh, how the defense developed and, and came around. You know, you, you gave gave them an extra week for a bye week, and they really made something out of it. You know, you gave the, the offense an extra week for a bye week, and and man, they turned it into corned beef hash. I don't know, you know, that's still a thing. Corned beef hash. Anybody ever heard of that? Yeah, no, it's pretty tasty, very salty. Yeah, yeah. but um, uh, it, so I I don't know. I think there there's, you know, I I think we still need to talk about in this in this podcast a little bit of the the. You know, you you just alluded to it with the transfer portal and uh, building teams via the transfer portal and, and the outside in philosophy and what have you. But um, no, I don't know. I mean, I think there's a lot of good to be said. I think the positive coming out of this game was the improvement of the offense. And if the, it or the geez, slap me with a but the improvement of the defense. And if the offense could just get serviceable again, you know, I mean, I, I don't know what happened to the offense we had the first three or four weeks where we were really effective, but it's gone and they need to figure it out. And I think the first answer is to run the ball. But um, the, the the improvement of the defense has got to be encouraging to people. And I think we'll get some people back off of injury. And I think Kelly's figuring out what to do with the personality he's got. So I don't know. Um the, the over, I, I really kind of felt like the last couple of days that that, you know, the the sole major problem. Well, there's, I guess, is a two piece or you know, the the only thing that's keeping us from from being a bowl team this year right now is the offensive line and the play calling on offense. You know, and until they get, if they don't get that fixed, you know, we're not going to win on a game on the way out until they freaking figure figure something else. And another, you know, yeah. I hope I, you know, regardless of what he decides to do, if Coach Prime has not already walked into Shermer's office and closed the door and said, "Tell me what you see, tell me what you would do," that's malpractice. Okay, if he hasn't 
had a hard discussion with O'Boyle or, or at least contemplated the idea of making a change. I mean, I, I don't know, you know, your ship is sinking because of one guy, you got to throw one guy overboard, you know, I don't know. And I don't know what's going on there to say one way or the other. Um, but uh, I don't know that, that it, 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 it's shocking to me that one position could be so egregiously bad. On a, on a power five football team, you know, with professional coaches and what have you. And I think it speaks to some level to, you know, both the offensive and the defensive lines on you know, back, back coming out of spring ball, maybe a little bit before spring ball, but primarily afterwards, I think, you know, <clears throat> when a lot of guys left after spring ball and there were some of us who said on, on, on the, the board, you know, you know, just loading up the whole offensive defensive line in one off season, not going to be as easy as you think. Oh, you're, you're, you're haters and you're not believers and sh shut your pie holes, man. I know football and I know there's not a thousand starting offensive defensive linemen getting into the portal wanting to come to Colorado because for the most part, if they're starting, they probably not going to leave where they are. Right. So thinking that we're going to get, you know, even people now think, well, we're going to get five NFL caliber offensive linemen in the portal. OK, well, good luck with that. You let me know how it works out. But where are they? Show me who they are and where we're going to get them, because, you know, those kinds of guys are not necessarily moving around. Maybe they like where they are. Um, you know, the guys that are obvious NFL guys are probably starting somewhere and, and probably don't have any incentive to leave that situation. Can I cut in with a question? No, this doesn't this <laughs> this doesn't fit into the the post spring ball exodus that you were mentioning there. But going back even further than that, if Colorado had Casey Roddick and Tommy Brown as their offensive guards this year, Six what would what, what, what would would Colorado have an extra win right now than four and four? I think so. I think probably so. Although, uh. It's interesting to me. I think, um, you know, I think they got pretty well coached by Devan and, and you know, going back to um, when uh, Kapilovich left and then the, 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 the you know, the, the rambling uh, uh, sous chef from New Orleans came in, um, you know, that that offensive line la did pretty well that first year under Rodriguez. And uh, I think it, you know, you can feel pretty good that though, that if, if Brown and Roddick were here with Wells, there'd be some carryover and continuity with those three guys. Um, well, even know. tank as well, you know? Yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. You know, and I think people would have gone nuts if it was, you know, four starters returning, but that offensive line last year was real, was pretty effective, quite frankly. Um, so yeah, I think having, having those two guys at the two guards would make a big difference. Um you know, would it start coming apart this late in the season? Because clearly there's something going wrong with, with the way O'Boyle's coaching them because they're getting worse each week. But, um, yeah, I think that might have made a difference. I don't know. I mean, again, when you watch that film and you watch guys taking the wrong direction steps, and I've said – I've been saying this in these podcasts all season long about the offensive line is, you know, you'll see plays where all five guys do the right thing and they look pretty good, and then you'll see other plays where one guy does something wrong and they look stupid. Uh, and that's been going on all year long, and it hasn't got fixed. So would it matter to have those two guys at guard? I don't know. You know, things are not getting fixed. If they're stepping the wrong direction and not following through with the right uh, technique or assignment, then no, it wouldn't make a difference. Somewhere along this 21-year uh, journey covering Colorado football, I've stopped preaching patience because there have been times where Colorado fans have been patient and uh, it didn't pay off for them, and so – I don't do that anymore. Um, the one question I would have for somebody that's super frustrated right now, though, yeah. is I would pose the question, would you rather have another head coach right now? You know, Coach Prime is probably making some people crazy about his unwillingness to run the football. But when you think about uh, what he's done to this program in the last 11 months, you probably still wouldn't choose anybody else to lead this program, right? Well, you got to be an idiot to, to to jump off of the prime bandwagon or the prime train at this point, because 
uh, you know, if nothing else, he's a professional, you know, and, and we haven't had that as a head coach for quite some time. And, and he's, he's not going to keep guys around on the, on the staff, I believe, who are not effective. Now, I don't know if he'll make the change before the season ends, but um, I, I don't think he's going to keep guys around if it's not working. And he's going to, and, and I think one of the things that, that people don't grasp about Deion Sanders is that, um, you know, when he was a player, it wasn't all talent. It was some of it was hard work and understanding and improving on things. You know, when things go, went wrong, he fixed them and didn't, didn't do that again. So, I think he's probably learning some hard lessons this season and, and I hope that they turn into some hard decisions that he makes. I hope he's making them right now um, in terms of who his coaches are and, and his philosophy going forward, but uh, certainly getting, you know, he's, I, I, we, we, we should still believe that we've got a great coach in here for bringing significant amounts of talent into the, into the team and you look at the defensive coaching staff and, and I like what they're doing there, you know, we just got to fix the offensive coaching staff. So yeah, I, absolutely. I think we got the right guy. Who the hell else would we have? You know I mean? We'd be winless right now. I think with anybody else. All right. Four games left. Oregon state, Arizona, both at Folsom field, then on the road at Washington state and at Utah, things have kind of changed a little bit there. Early this season, it looked like Al Washington State, you pretty much would chalk up as a loss. Uh, they've really struggled in recent weeks, and now all of a sudden that looks like more of a winnable game. Arizona, though, has caught fire in its, I think, what, season three or four under Jed Fish. Um, he's finally yeah. got that thing going in the right direction, and uh, that, that game looks uh, less winnable now. Oregon State just got knocked off by Arizona, but, you know, that's a football team that, uh, you know, is going to present uh, a big challenge for Colorado, especially the, the defense. We'll see if their defensive uh, improvement that they showed against UCLA can show against a really strong Oregon State front. Um, that's going to be a tough game. Uh, have we gotten into the must-win territory yet in, in terms well, of bowl eligibility? Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, you know, every game's a must win at this point, you know, um, you know, there's only four chances left to get two wins. So you got to go 50, 50, you know, I mean, kind of goes without saying, but um, I think, you know, one of the things you can take away from this UCLA game is that we played with them, you know, we, you know, uh, <clears throat> short of an aptitude up front on offensive play calling, you know, defensively, we, we contain them and they're a decent team. They're as good as any of the four teams we're, we're facing the rest of the way out. Um, if we can just get, some answers on offense, um, we could still be a pretty deep, pretty, pretty decent team, you know? So I don't, there, there's not anybody left on the schedule. You, you know, Utah without, without their quarterback is, is not the world beater that they've have been in recent years. So there's a puncher's chance in all four of these games, frankly, I think, you know, uh, I mean, it's better than the last year. There was, there, there was no point even going to games. We weren't yeah. going to beat anybody, you know. I mean, so yeah, I, I think we can go into every game with with, with the possibility of a win. Um, we got to improve on that on on the offense significantly. But if we have that, if we have the, the UCLA game defense in the last last four games, we're going to be in them. Yeah, you know. And if we can, and if we can recover that offensive mojo that we had the first half of the season, or you know first half of Stanford, second half of USC. I mean, that offense is still there. It's the same dudes, same coaches. Um, you know, if we can get back to that sort of standard, yeah, we can win. You know, there's not any one of these four teams that you look at and go, well, we can't win that. You know, I mean, we we, we, we play Oregon 100 times right now. We're going to lose those 100 times and, and, you know, frankly get blown out in more than half of them probably because that's just not realistic to look at that team. You know, if we had Washington still on the schedule, we're not beating that team. Um, but any of these four we got left, yeah, it, it, it's absolutely a realistic possibility. You know, part of the thing is they they gotta they gotta keep these guys believing. You know, and off, I think the defense has plenty to believe in. Man, they got to do something up in the headspace of that offense, though. And well, I don't know. I'm I'm worried about Shadur Sanders' health too. Yeah, going forward, he. You feel so bad for him. He is banged up right now, and he's not complaining about it, and he's not pointing fingers. He just continues to take a beating, though, week after week, and it's 
kind of catching up to him at this point. There has been talk of that Prime had this outside in philosophy. And I don't know if that's a thing he actually said or not. I don't know that I ever recalled actually hearing it, but clearly, clearly if that's a philosophy, I think what we're seeing this year is that it's, that it's not necessarily one that you can work with, at least on the offensive line. You've got to bring those guys in. Well, coach prime mentioned after the game that they need to get new guys on the offensive line. He, he spelled it out. Uh, after the game. So he certainly learned that. I think what he means by that is that he knows as long as he's the head coach of Colorado, they're going to naturally attract really good skill players. Yeah. And so it's not, we don't need the guys in the trenches. It's more, I'm just willing to admit that there's going to yeah. be corners that want to play football for okay. my program. I think it's kind of how I take that. That's fair enough. I guess that's probably a better understanding of it. I mean, we just we're, – we're, we're I mean, to that point, though, is – I mean, the D-line had a really solid performance against UCLA, so it's – Yeah, it's, and they're getting, they're getting better. But they have good coaching. And I have to disagree very strongly with Coach Prime calling out the players on the offensive line. If you're going to call out the players on the offensive line and say Bill O'Boyle's name, say it. You know, because if you're going to throw the players under the bus, throw, throw the guy coaching them under the bus too, man. I mean, let's just be fair and honest here. The dude making the big bucks ought to be the first name that you mentioned, you know, not the poor dopes that are trying to play the dang game the way he's teaching them to play it. So I don't know. It, the whole thing. I, the I, thing I, is, the thing is, though, you, you you don't know what Coach Prime is thinking and what's happening behind the scenes, right? And there's so much access now that we get with Coach Prime's team meetings and, and things, but there's so much that they don't show. They're – I, yeah. I think that's I. You know, everybody wants these press conferences to be a, a gotcha moment over and over again, and you know, just uh, attack these people. It doesn't really fix the problem. What fixes the problem is what happens behind the scenes. Okay, but 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 but, but my point is, if you're going to say I'm going to, we got to get all new players in here. He didn't. He didn't mention players by name, and he actually said that there are some guys in the program that, with some seasoning, will be pretty good but also then added that we're going to get some new players as well. So it was, it's not like he said, you know, player X did this. So he wasn't calling out individuals that that's one area where I think people overanalyze these press conferences a little bit too much. Yeah. I don't know. I mean, I don't know. I didn't see the press conference or any film of it. This, you know, I'm just kind of going on what I, what I what was told that uh, that he's, he's, talking about got to replace players well you know your first priority there your first problem there is how they're being coached and you know if you can't face that and walk into the office of the dude who works for you then you're not the guy i thought you were well there's no uh question how you feel about things going with the offense right now following this uh, uh, podcast you know i'm a i'm a lying guy you know and for 20 freaking years at CU, I've watched the offensive line suck every damn year. And the Yahoo's on the damn board, they blame me for it, you know, for some reason. I don't get it. I don't really understand it. I'm not coaching these guys. I'm not recruiting these clowns. But I'm sick to death of, of, of turning on the team that I love. And every single year, the offensive line sucks, man. It ain't rocket science to put together a good offensive line. Look at Oregon State. They're not recruiting five-star guys, and they do it. And I am sick to death of, of showing up every damn year. And, uh, you know, I know all the, all the, all the Albert Einstein's on the board to know everything. Oh, they don't have any talent. Well, there's talent out there. You know, the, 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 the procession of tomato cans we got as offensive line coaches can't put that talent to any use. And that's even more frustrating to me than watching them struggle. Um, because I know what's capable of an of an offensive line with good coaching and I'm sick of seeing it. I'm sick of it, man. Sick of it. Well, when you put last... yourself you put yourself out there. Uh, I do as well, you know, when you do that and people get frustrated, they look for a source to project that frustration and so I think that um while it, maybe it's not fair at times, you you get a, what do they say? Be like a duck and I mean it just it's not I mean, it's I, not it's not about you. It's about what they're they're venting and their process. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I used to, I used to I used to get I used to like respond to stuff, you know, following losses in notifications in the message board where people get angry at me. And um it did get to a point where I realized it's just their way of venting in that not yeah. to take it personally. 
but don't misunderstand my 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 frustration is not what's set on the board. My frustration is turning is watching a CU football game every 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 week for the last twenty years and seeing garbage on the offensive line. I'm sick of it, man. I'm sick of it. I mean, you know, I, I can't. I guess we had a serviceable offensive line in 2016 to get 10 wins, but aside from that, you know, we come back the next year with 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 five starters back, and the offensive line sucks. You know, we yeah. got we got guys up there getting paid. You know, significant. You know, I do a more important job than these damn coaches do. Okay, and I get paid significantly less than they do, and they aren't even good at it. So be good at what you're getting paid to do. That's all I'm saying. Uh, I'm, I'm just sick to death of, of, of crap offensive line play at, at the University of Colorado. All right. Well, that was a good happy show, birthday, William. everyone. Have, have a happy day. <laughs> See, you got I'm, me all worked up. You can't I, just I'm, try, I'm, trying to, I'm trying to think of how to close this show out, and there's not a yeah. – uh, like a good idea popping into my head right now. You can't let me. You can't let me go off like this because what if I go out and there's a, a bus full of kindergarten kids or something? You know. <laughs> well, yeah. No, I would. Uh, I would definitely suggest some breathing exercises, William, before you go out in society. Uh, <laughs> do a little med- meditation session. Yeah. Get your heart rate down a little bit and. Uh, fingers crossed and hopefully uh our post Oregon State game is talking about how like the cornerbacks this week they had a bounce back effort how nice yeah. would that be yeah well we'll see and hopefully they get something done you know and I, sometimes I think after you know when, when we're having our conversation you know and I often think afterwards like uh uh I probably said too much or got too worked up but it's just very it's just very frustrating well your passion was felt and uh you know, like I said, I think that's kind of the general sentiment from a lot of diehards after Saturday's game. Of um, it was kind of between the second half of the Stanford game and then the UCLA game, just kind right. of this right. the first time this season, kind of feeling a little bit of that hopelessness. That right, okay, right. You know, the, and and also just to your point, I mean, this is entertainment. This is supposed to be fun, and when you turn on the TV like you mentioned as an offensive line guy and you see that performance, it's not fun. And so no. you want that feeling back that you had early in the season when uh, right. you were enjoying these games and it was a joy to watch. Even at times the O-line struggled early on, but uh, it was still a product that you, that you, uh, you got to escape, like you said, from your day job and, and get that uh, good feeling leaving those games. And I, and I, you know, I think back to earlier in the season, you mentioned that. And, and, and I remember thinking very clearly, even when we were, when, you know, we were three, and know, and things were rolling going, you know, everybody figures the wheels are going to come off this thing. And we're not going to, you know, everybody's saying three, four, five wins, even if we only get, and I, and I thought to myself, even if we only get the six wins, that's going to be, you know, six losses. I'm a mathematical genius. Thank you. I figured that out all by myself without any help. Um, but that's going to be six games in which everybody's like, oh, well, you know, that didn't work out like we expected. And I, and I really wondered at that point, how were people going to handle, you know, it's all great when we're, when we're three and oh, and, 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 you know, uh, the Saturday shows are coming to Boulder and everything else, you know, when, when, if, if, and when, and we have kind of reverted back to the expectation to some extent, how will people handle that? How will prime handle that? And it's interesting to watch uh, people and, and how they handle it. And, so, you know, some people keep a little bit of perspective and, and realize this is a more of a longer term thing. Um, and I think back, you know, it, I think back to Bill McCartney and, and his first couple of years here. He didn't have the staff. He didn't have that championship level staff until three or four years in. You know, I mean, he got rid of some guys after year one. He got rid of some guys after year two. And it. And I think it takes a while to finally get the, the the really top level staff that you need. And I also think that people who are fans and follow this sport at this level don't understand how important coaching is. And the big the big reason for that is they're all high school kids, man, or they're all coming out of high school and they have to be taught how to play the game. OK, they have to be taught how to live life for many of them. Um, and if you don't have that and you don't have those good coaches, it's not just the recruiting and the Jimmy's and the Joe's and that crap. It's a, it's, it, you have to develop these young men as football players and as people. And 
sometimes it's, you know, you know, sometimes you get, sometimes that first year you hire who you can hire, you know, but I have to believe that Deion Sanders with his connections in the football world has got to be talking to people and saying, okay, who do I need to fix this offensive line? And I have faith. I have faith that he's going to go out and do that. And that's, what's different. Above all else, the thing that's impressed me most about Coach Prime is the fact of how he's handled these losses. Yeah. You know, because we didn't quite know how he was going to respond to losses. And um, I didn't know if it would turn into um, really going after the press and kind of having this fractured relationship there. And um, he knows, you know, that this team has been hurt, served some humble pie and and has responded in the right way. Right. Now, um, he he kept his class and, and let's be honest, you know, there's a lot of people out there who want him to fail uh, for whatever reasons, you know, and, and who are waiting for him to fail and ready to jump out there and say, told you so and point fingers and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, those, those people, I don't know, whatever, they're losers to begin with. It's like if you if you can't if you if all you got is to watch for somebody to fail because as he says, I think it always comes down to his self-confidence and pinches on their insecurities. Um yeah, too bad for them. You know, I think in the long run this is gonna work out. But I think yeah. it's also a learning process. I think it's a learning process for him this year. And I think that, you know, one of the things that that Deion Sanders has that's a that's, that's been a revelation to me is he's got some humility. He 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 he's he's learns things, you know. And if if you're if you're just totally an arrogant jerk, you don't learn things because you think, well, I know more than everybody else. And he learns and he's gonna learn and he's gonna make better decisions and, and get things right moving forward. I don't know. Yep. You know, it's always been a question mark as to how things would happen this season, and we'll see how it goes the last four games. But uh, what's different is that you have hope that it's all going to get straightened out in the longer term. Well, th- it looks like it's going to warm up a little bit as the week goes along here, and it should be a, a perfect fall Saturday evening with Oregon State coming in. So, uh, again, hopefully our next podcast is a little bit more cheerful than this one. Uh, thanks for folks for sitting there through uh, hearing our frustration. Uh, but, uh, you know, there's still four games left. And so uh, let, let's see what happens. Yeah. Hopefully it can be a little bit cathartic listening to us and, you know, ho- hopefully there, some it, sitting out there going what he said. <laughs> and in, in my expletive laced uh, little rant there, I don't, I don't know if you can cut that out, but <laughs> I, I might have to that you might have crossed the line on that one. So uh, I haven't decided yet. I'm going to go back yeah. and re-listen to it, but uh, there, there might be, I don't know, a minute of this show that, that goes uh, missing, g- goes on the, the cutting room floor. <laughs> and then, then there'll be the big conspiracy. Hey, what happened to the missing uh, minute? You know, like those <laughs> Bruder tapes and the Nixon tapes. And where, 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 where are the monster tiger uh, gardener tapes? <laughs> Should I put that in a side folder? Maybe when we have cheerful days and we can have a sense of humor about it, I, I can actually release that that minute of audio. <laughs> yeah, it might be might be good. Well, you you're the boss, man. You you got to do what you got to do. I I'm just a schmo that comes on here and. Well, I just know that we this is supposed to be a clean podcast. I know I've let a, a, a few profanities slip over the the course of time. I, I don't yeah. think they ding you with one, but uh, that that was probably your your strongest. Uh, use of language that we've that we've, that we've had from mr gardner yeah i don't even remember what we were talking about at that particular moment but i'll tell you what <laughs> you were fired up i'm gonna save that it's gonna come out at some point yeah. but if, I, if uh, i'd have had you know the hospital monitor on it had been going beep, 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 beep. <laughs> yeah you're right now everybody's gonna be obsessing about that but uh i'm sorry i i just i gotta make sure i gotta find out the rules on what we can put out there and still have this be uh uh, getting up on the Apple iTunes and, and all the podcast apps out there. Right. Right. <laughs> well, that's your, that, that, that's a you problem, my friend. All right. Fair enough. William, it was great to hear your passion though. Seriously. Thanks for coming on as always and appreciate uh, everybody out there for tuning in. <laughs>